Welcome back, everyone. Before lunch, we learned how our ESG policies will guide our work over the next several years. And now we're going to look at the investment climate from a completely different perspective through the lens of evolving technology. Ted has some distinguished guests to offer their expertise on how technology is driving rapid change across all industries and how that change impacts investment decisions. One of the panelists is on his way. He had a, a technology problem with his flight and he's <laughs> been redirected, but he's, he should be with us shortly. So Ted, will you introduce our panelists? Great, thank you, uh, Ms. Mother. Thank you very much. Yes, all the planning and logistics work, um, you're still um, reliant on the, uh, the old world economy of actually getting people here <laughs> on time through uh, planes, trains, and automobiles. But uh, Vivek should be here, uh, uh, he says about 145. And in that regard, um, uh, I will first uh, introduce our, our panelists. Uh, and following that brief introduction, uh, we had planned to show about a 10-minute video, so that actually will work, in, uh, work pretty well with uh, uh, trying to give some uh, extra time for uh, Vivek to get here, uh, which uh, a video is a, from, a, from an actual TED Talk uh, by a senior partner at the Boston Consulting Group, which we think will um, provide a very good overview of uh, this very interesting topic. Uh, by way of introduction, before we play, uh, you know, play the videotape, uh, I'll go from my far left uh, uh, then uh, to uh, Steve next to me. Uh, first, I'd, it's my great pleasure to invite all, all of our guests on our panel today. Uh, Lee Lu, Mr. Lee Lu, I, uh, I am just uh, so glad that uh, you uh, come to join us. Uh, we actually met uh, at a technology uh, conference that uh, uh, that you helped uh, organize and uh, put forward in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, Li Lu is the uh, founder and chairman of Himalaya Capital, uh, based in uh, Pasadena, California. We actually have three Californians on our, uh, on our panel today, so we have a geographic theme of, uh, of Californians. Uh, his firm primarily focuses on long-term investment opportunities in Asia and the United States. Uh, he's been running uh, his firm's principal fund continuously since uh, 1998. Um, a brief um, a biographical uh, note, uh, Li Lu was born and raised in China, and when he came to the United States, uh, he learned uh, English quite rapidly and uh, matriculated into Columbia University after I think about a year uh, or so, is that right? And uh, he earned his, uh, earned his undergraduate BA, his J JD from the Columbia Law School, and his MBA uh, from the Columbia Business School all, all in six years. Uh, he's one of the uh, world's uh, recognized uh, leaders in investment management, active investing, and among other things, he um, uh, by chance met Warren Buffett, I think, at Columbia, and an accolade of value investing uh, by Mr. Uh, as pursued by Mr. Buffett and um, Mr. Charlie Munger as well. So we're very lucky to have, uh, have, you, have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Um, Steve Poisner, immediately to my left. Steve, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, Steve is familiar to perhaps uh, many of the board members uh, because of his public policy work uh, here in, in the state. Uh, I've come to know him in the context of the technology sphere, uh, where uh, Steve was a you know early uh, California uh, entrepreneur uh, in technology investing, he launched and uh, built and sold three uh, technology companies uh, out of Silicon Valley. Uh, one of those, I'm not sure if all three, but at least one of those sold to Qualcomm in San Diego. Uh, where uh, he later, you know, developed over a, start, a dozen startups uh, as a senior uh, professional at Qualcomm. Um, he's devoted his uh, time and attention to public policy pursuits in a whole number of spheres, both elected office as well as uh, charitable and uh, other efforts. I'm, uh, as a son of a public school teacher, I'm most impressed by the year you spent uh, devoted to as a public teacher in our school system. I think uh, that intersection of public policy and investing is something that uh, we, uh, our board, 
and our investment office spend so much time thinking about that crucial intersection between investment themes and, and public policy. Uh, I came to uh, uh, know uh, Steve a little more directly uh, as part of his effort to chair a nonprofit organization uh, called the Alliance for Southern California Innovation, uh, which he uh, brainstormed and, uh, and uh, brought to life, uh, which is a nonprofit that is focused on building a world-class technology hub in Southern California, perhaps to, uh, <laughs> excellent, perhaps to uh, rival perhaps even Silicon Valley. And I'm joined <laughs> by our good friend, uh, Vivek Ranadive. Uh, Vivek, welcome, perfect timing. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, the third of our Californians uh, who has a foot both in the South Silicon Valley as well as in our hometown of Sacramento as the owner and chairman of the Sacramento uh, Kings. Uh, Vivek is one of the world's uh, leading technology entrepreneurs. Uh, he pioneered the use of the real-time event processing software that uh, he created and grew into a multi-billion dollar company that he brought public called TIBCO, whose software is used throughout the private and public uh, sectors. Uh, in addition to his philanthropic and other professional endeavors, I could actually talk quite a bit about the Sacramento Kings, but I'll try not to, uh, <laughs> just as it's an excursion that uh, will keep us from too much time. Uh, I do think it's important to note that uh, just recently, in 2016, uh, Vivek founded a venture capital fund uh, with the UC Regents, uh, known as uh, Bo Capital. And that partnership with the UC system is to look for uh, startups emerging from the UC system, technology system. And it's a very innovative and interesting partnership that's been developed. Uh, so with that uh, introduction of our panel, um, we thought we would provide a bit of context with this video uh, from uh, the Boston Consulting Group. I think it provides a very good bridge of our discussion earlier today on ESG themes to really anticipating a world of disruptive uh, change uh, occurring uh, through technology uh, adaptation. It's been um, observed that this rate of change has been occurring at, uh, at a rate you know, known as uh, Moore's Law over time, uh, which is attributed to 1965 by Gordon Moore from Intel, uh, stating that the number of transistors per square inch on integrated circuits would double every year since their invention. And in many contexts with respect to technological change, that ratio and that uh, level of disruption has been occurring over the past 50 years. Uh, really, there have been three technology eras uh, looking back over that time that roughly correspond to this notion of Moore's Law. Uh, many of those, ma many, each of those is familiar to our board. Uh, the first being the introduction of the personal computer, uh, which really allowed uh, uh, people in their home and office to uh, really handcraft knowledge uh, at the seat of their uh, personal computer. The next era came with the internet and the um, uh, combination uh, of data and um, connectivity uh, that we see in such great firms as Google and Facebook and Amazon and others around the globe. And now we're here today to talk about the next, the next era of really digital artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, image and voice recognition, all fostering a new age of adaptation in the world. This is impacting virtually all industries, and we'll see a good summary of that in this, uh, this discussion. Uh, in the McKinsey report, that's a background materials for all of the board in, in today's presentation, they estimate that uh, $40 billion was spent last year 80% uh, of that by tech giants to advance their capability uh, in this one field. And although high adoption is occurring in high tech, 
in telecommunications. There are many other examples in the real economy of innovation and disruption that's coming. Retailers uh, can know more about what shoppers want, sometimes even before the shopper himself or herself knows what they want. Uh, artificial intelligence can make uh, the smart grid smarter and perhaps reduce the need for utilities to add power plants. In healthcare, there's the promise of quicker diagnosis, better treatment plans, and improved health insurance. So those are small example. Why don't we begin with this video? It's about 10 minutes, and once we're done with the video, we'll turn to a, a Q&A period with our panelists and uh, further discussion with our board. So if we could cue the video. We're in the midst of a major confrontation between an irresistible force and an immovable object. It's going to have a life or death impact on the world's largest and best companies, the companies that drive our economies and that fund our pensions. The irresistible force is technology disruption, and the immovable object is the change monster, the inability of large companies to change quickly. So let's explore the protagonists in this confrontation a little bit more. Start with technology disruption. So, so why this sudden resurgence in disruption? Well, for one thing, we're all connected now. We're connected as consumers. We're connected as businesses. And more than just being connected to each other, we're connected to a large and growing, albeit rather adolescent still, digital ecosystem, and, and let me explain what I mean by that digital ecosystem and, and how fast it is growing. So the gateway to that system is devices. Today there are three billion humans who are connected via broadband to this digital ecosystem, and that number will grow to four billion by 2017. And the way in which we're connected is changing more and more by smart mobile devices. And that's really important because that drives much more usage. To date, we've downloaded something like 100 billion apps. And every day, we upload 2 billion photographs. So if you think that what happens in Vegas or Berlin stays in Vegas or Berlin, I'm afraid it doesn't. Uh, it ends up on Snapchat and Facebook and social media. So, devices. And then beyond devices connecting humans, there is, of course, the Internet of Things. By 2020, we may have as many as hundreds of billions of sensors connected via tens of billions of devices in the Internet of Things. Then there's the connectivity itself. The speed of connection is going to increase, perhaps threefold over the next four years. Then there's the cloud, this place where we go for cheap storage and computing power. And in fact, 2014 is a real watershed year for the cloud. It will be the first year in which workload in the cloud will be bigger than the workload that takes place in traditional IT environments in our corporations. And that ratio is set to move to two-thirds, one-third by 2017. And then there's data, of course, the data explosion. By the year 2020, the amount of data that we create and store will go up tenfold. So adolescent it may be, but it's a pretty impressive digital ecosystem. But why is it driving disruption? Well, I think there are two sets of reasons. The first one is it's changing the clock speed. It's changing the clock speed from linear to exponential. It's changing the speed of take-up of new businesses. It's changing the speed of innovation. Think about take-up. Think about the time it takes for a new business to acquire 50 million customers. Go back to the mid-2000s, and it took Facebook three years and eight months. Fast forward to uh, the instant messaging app, WhatsApp, it took them 15 months. Fast forward again to the popular mobile game, Angry Birds, 
It took Angry Birds 15 days. So the speed of take-up is driving exponentially. Think also about business model innovation. Imagine where Amazon is going into the future. It's quite possible that in the not too distant future, maybe 50% of everything you need will be available through Amazon and will be delivered to your doorstep within four hours of you ordering it. If that future comes to pass, that's truly disruptive for traditional retailers. So the clock speed is changing. The other reason it's disruptive is because there are many, many other technologies that are being built, which, if on a standalone basis, may not be disruptive. But when you hook them up to that digital ecosystem, they become profoundly disruptive. Think about 3D printing as an example. The technology for 3D printing has been around for several years. But when you connect it up to that digital ecosystem, it suddenly becomes very, very disruptive. First of all, you have access to all of that open source innovation, everyone else's uh, files. Then you also have software that is really easy to use, very interoperable, and a, a, a world apart from the CAD systems, the proprietary systems that engineers have used. And then lastly, of course, you can print the objects to the remote locations where the demand exists. So if you have a mine that has, a, that has stopped production because they need a spare part, you can print that spare part in the location to get that mine working again. So I think this digital ecosystem really does drive disruption, and it spells a world of real opportunity until we consider the immovable objects, the inability of large organizations to change. So we all know that change is difficult. Um, about 70% of change programs fail in, uh, in large organizations. And that's at the normal old clock speed. Things get tougher in this new world. Tougher for a couple of reasons. Firstly, leadership. Leaders tend to make decisions based on experience. The problem is, many of today's leaders don't have a lot of experience in disruptive technology. And so, that's a problem. I, I was speaking to a CIO recently who said, I'm worried about the cloud. I'm, I'm actually not sure it's mature enough, so my strategy is to wait and see. I'm going to hold back. That's that uh, risk-averse thinking that comes from the lack of experience. Cognitive scientists call it um, unconscious learning and it drives a risk-averse behavior. Then there's also organizational inertia. Organizations tend to reward delivery of results today, more so than the building of capabilities that will deliver results tomorrow. And so, if I give you the example of the telecommunications industry, um, it's improving its productivity, but at a rate of about 3 to 6% per annum. These are linear outcomes, incremental outcomes, against a world of exponential opportunity. So I think the big question is, what happens next? Clearly, a lot of companies will fail. I think leading corporations are doing at least three things. The first one is around the leadership. We need to challenge that mindset of unconscious learning. We need to unlearn some of that uh, experience. We also need to add executives to the leadership team who are digital natives and who don't have anything to unlearn. I think there's a real imperative for organizations to make a massive change in the skill set in the organization. So some companies are building disruptive businesses. Telstra, the um, Australian telco, is building a disruptive software business. But it's interesting, it's building it some distance from the main organization so that it can have a different clock speed, it can have a different culture. And then back in the core of the business, of course, there are some major skill shifts that need to happen. It's less about hardware and more about software. It's less about traditional IT, it's more about digital and mobile. And it's absolutely about data and analytics. 
So companies like American Express and BNP Paribas are good examples of companies who are starting to put digital and data at the heart of their operating model. And then thirdly, it's about change management and it's about making that change happen at scale, at an industrial level. So I think that this confrontation is actually changing the nature of competition. And I think that over the next two CEO tenures, we're actually going to see a redefinition of what competitive advantage means. Okay, great, thank you. Hopefully that uh, sets the scene now. We'll turn to, uh, turn to our panel. I'm gonna e ask each of you to reflect on this one. And Vivek, maybe I'll start with you since uh, you're from our hometown of Sacramento. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, the building of uh, your company in that era and then uh, s some about your, your uh, uh, background in doing that and then turn you know, to your view on the next 10 years. What is coming next? And I know digital is at the heart of, heart of that question. Okay. Supposedly, I'm sorry I was late. Uh, I couldn't land in Petaluma, it was fogged in, so I had to land in Santa Rosa. Uh, but I also wanted to thank all of you for what you do. I have uh, two kids who went to uh, UCs and uh, I'm, I came to California without a penny in my pocket. So everything I have, I owe to the great state of California, and I know you guys work hard with what you do, and I just wanted to thank you for that. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I, I grew up in Bombay. I'm an immigrant, and when you get older, you look back on your life, and you try to think about, you know, was there something that was the defining moment in your life? And for me, it happened when I was a little boy, and it was the middle of the night. I was in Bombay, and I had my ear plastered to a little transistor radio, and I heard these uh, magical words, uh, one small step for man, uh, one giant leap for mankind. Uh, I was listening to the moon landing and uh, the Voice of America was broadcasting it live uh, to Bombay. Uh, and I said to myself, you know, wow, you know, who, who are these people that were able to take a man, uh, put him in a box, and send him 250,000 miles away uh, to land on a rock flawlessly the first time? Uh, what what vision, what brilliance, uh, what courage. And I said, I want to be one of them. Uh, so I uh, decided I was going to study hard and I was going to study science and technology. Uh, and uh, I said, I want to come to America. So that was kind of the start of my dream and my journey. I, I came here, I uh, went to MIT and Harvard. Um, and the big idea that I had was I was a hardware engineer and I was always frustrated with how software was done. It seemed like the hardware was always on time and budget, uh, and the software never quite got there. Uh, and so I came up with this notion, why not do uh, software like you do hardware? So if you look at a computer or you take the top of your chip, uh, you'll see there's a, uh, the problem to be solved is broken into pieces, and the pieces are tied together by a, by a bus, and then different things plug into that bus. Uh, and so my big idea was to, was to build a software bus where applications and systems could all connect through a single interface, an API, uh, and all communicate in real time. And, uh, and this ended up being disruptive in, in just about uh, every uh, industry. So, so that was kind of my, uh, my big idea. And it was driven by the notion that if you get the right information to the right place at the right time, and you put in the right context, uh, then you can make the world a better place. And so that's kind of been uh, my notion throughout. And uh, and as exciting as the last uh, 15 years have been in terms of the changes uh, we've seen and some of the things that uh, the BCG gentleman talked about, uh, we're entering what is going to be the most uh, disruptive era in the history of mankind. Uh, we're entering what I call Civilization 3.0. So Civilization 1.0 was the start of modern civilization it was driven by the agrarian revolution. Uh, people were farmers and shopkeepers and, and carpenters, and it was the age of the artisan. Uh, land was the raw material. Uh, then with the industrial revolution, we entered uh, 2.0, as I refer to it, uh, and it was the age of the corporation. It was about efficiency. Energy and steel uh, were the raw materials. Uh, so we're now entering a time where the world's largest bookseller has no bookstores, and the world's 
largest taxi company has no cars, and the world's largest hotel owns no real estate. Uh, and so it's, it's really uh, the age of, uh, of information and, and service and, and data. And so we're entering truly this, this digital age uh, that we're all talking about. Uh, and this is gonna be more disruptive, uh, uh, mostly in a good way, but there is a dark side to it. Uh, and you know, when the world went from 1.0 to 2.0, only five or 6% of the 1.0 jobs were still there in 2.0. So as we go from 2.0 to 3.0, uh, we're gonna see, unfortunately, uh, a similar uh, disruption. And so we have to be, be thinking about this and we have to be thinking about what we can do uh, to offset uh, the negative ramifications uh, from, from this kind of a disruption. Uh, so we've reached this point of exponential evolution. We're gonna see change like we've never seen before. You know, there's gonna be a lot of good things. We're gonna eliminate diseases. Uh, we're gonna um, have less waste. We're gonna uh, have uh, more efficient use of energy. Uh, so there's gonna be a lot of good things, but there's also gonna be uh, problems uh, associated with it. Uh, but it also, from an investment perspective, we're gonna see opportunity like we've never ever seen before. There's literally trillion dollar industries uh, that are being born right in front of our eyes right now. Uh, but equally, there's industries that are being uh, disrupted and many years ago when Amazon first started and I was a huge fan of Amazon and I coined this expression about getting Amazon and now people are kind of getting it that almost every business is getting Amazon and what, that, what I mean by that is that you have to ask yourself is can, you know can Amazon put me out of business by just doing this uh, and you start buying it from them uh, just through pushing a button uh, rather than actually going to a store uh, now in my mind there's a few forces that you should be familiar with uh, that are gonna uh, drive some of this disruption, you know, and some of them uh, the BCG gentleman talked about. One is just the explosion of data. So if you look at all of the data that's been created from the start of mankind till today, and you call it X, then in the last year there's like 10X that data. So today we'll put more videos on YouTube than Hollywood has created in its entire history. So there's just an explosion of data and that keeps going up and up and up. Uh, the second is the rise of mobility. So it took 100 years for there to be a billion landline phones. It took just 10 years for there to be a billion cell phones, and it took only one year for there to be uh, a billion smart cell phones. And this thing that you have in your pocket has more computing capacity than the entire NASA space program had when we put man on the moon when I was listening to it in Bombay. So we're all walking around, there's billions of people walking around the planet with this incredible computing capacity in their pocket. Uh, the third force is just the emergence of platforms so that, uh, you know, to the BCG gentleman's point, you don't need to be a large corporation uh, to reach large audiences and through, through the use of so, uh, Facebook or YouTube or some of the other platforms, uh, it, it democratizes reach so that anyone uh, can reach these people. The fourth is one that I know Lilu will talk about, which is the emergence of uh, Asian economies. A few hundred years ago, China and India were two-thirds of the world economy, and I think most economists predict that at some point in this century, uh, we will revert to that situation. Uh, the fifth one is my favorite, and I call it math jumping science. And what I mean by this is that you don't anymore have to know the why, you just have to know what the pattern is. Uh, and when AIDS researchers were trying to figure out how the AIDS virus mutated, uh, they spent years and years and years and they couldn't figure it out. They made it into a math uh, problem and put it into a game called Folded and then within a week, uh, people found the solution. So everything ends up being basically a, a pattern recognition problem, you know, which kind of gets you into, into, into machine learning and deep machine learning. Uh, 15 years ago, it, there's not a computer scientist on the planet that could have predicted that you could have a, a driverless car. Uh, you know, and probably, you know, your grandkids will never drive a car. Uh, and it's funny because we call them driverless cars because we used to call cars horseless carriages. And so, you know, it's, we're seeing that same, same type of progression. As recently as five years ago, I don't think any computer scientist would have predicted that you could have a computer program beat a human at goal much less a, a world champion at goal. Uh, and if you think about how 
amazing that feat is. And if you think of what's the biggest number you can think of and you say, well, you know, atoms in the universe. There's 10 raised to 70 atoms in the universe. There's 10 raised to 80, 180. That's one followed with 180 zeros. Possible combinations in the game of Go. And yet, you know, computers are now beating the world's best Go players like a drum. So we've reached this point of exponential growth and you know, deep machine learning and math computing science is, is one of the driving forces. So anyways, I think it's a really exciting time. I think there's some challenges, uh, but uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Vivek. Maybe I'll turn Steve to, to you now, talk a little bit about the building of your company and, uh, and then what you see uh, for the 10 years and kind of what motivated you to start this nonprofit as well. Great, uh, good afternoon everybody, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've, uh, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life, love being an entrepreneur. Uh, Ted asked me to describe a little bit about wh what's it like being an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley in particular. Anybody here watch the HBO show Silicon Valley here? It's a pretty accurate show, it's pretty funny. Um, Silicon Valley is a special place and I, I do want to talk about a little bit later about the opportunities uh, for Southern California to emerge as the next Silicon Valley. But let me just say, uh, I've started three companies in Silicon Valley over a 30-year period. And it, being an entrepreneur for me has been pretty rough. Not one of my companies has gone according to plan, at least not according to the original plan. Take my second company, for example. You probably never heard of it. It's called SnapTrack. Uh, you have my technology with you right now. We figured out a way to embed a GPS receiver into a cell phone. That turned out to be a big feature. Every time you use Uber, of course, you tap into this technology. But at the time, about 15 years ago, people thought it was a physical impossibility to get a GPS receiver to work inside of a cell phone. Now, why is that? Well, not, not to get too geeky here. I, I do have an engineering degree. I apologize for that. But GPS receivers uh, were designed by the Air Force. And there's 24 GPS satellites up in the sky uh, that the Air Force has put up there, all spaced out. And each of these GPS receivers uh, GPS satellites are 11,000 miles up and they're traveling at 25,000 miles an hour across the sky and they emit these signals and if your GPS receiver on earth can receive three or more of these GPS satellite signals you can if you remember your high school trigonometry you can triangulate and you can calculate real accurately where you are the trick of it all though is that these GPS satellite signals are very weak by the time they get to the surface of the earth so most people thought well, gosh, you, yes, you put a GPS receiver on a ship or on an airplane or on the head of a cruise missile where you have a clear view of the sky. Yes, that's, that was what they were thinking about. But to put a GPS receiver into a cell phone, which has tons of, of interference because of its transmitter, used in a room like this where a lot, of, a lot of cell phones are used at the side of your head, no way. It's impossible. But what we figured out at SnapTrack is well, GPS satellite signals come into this room right now. They just get attenuated as they go through the building material. Our invention was to figure out how to process these very weak GPS satellite signals. We thought this was a big idea. So off to Sand Hill Road, we went. Now, if you watch the, the, the HBO show, you know, Sand Hill Road is that one square mile of Silicon Valley where there's like 100 VCs all in one place. Now, VCs are not very pleasant people. Present company accepted, of course. They're difficult because they, 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 all they do every day is hear pitch after pitch after pitch, and they, they're really good at, at saying no. I thought, though, this idea was so big, I would get a royal reception. Well, I've never been treated so rudely. The first VC that I talked to about raising money for my company, he laughed me out of his office. No way you can put a GPS receiver into a cell phone. Ne went next door. VC number two, no laughing this time. He was yelling and pointing at me, accusing me of pitching voodoo physics. I went 0 for 10 on Sand Hill Road. Couldn't raise money at all for the idea. What do we do? So we came up with this idea of let's go back to the military. Maybe they can test the technology and give us some credibility. After all, it is their system and, and we can get some credibility. I didn't know anybody in the military. So I called the Pentagon, the reception board there, and talked to the, the receptionist at the Pentagon. And I asked, please connect me 
to the person in the Pentagon that analyzes soldier tracking technology. He didn't know what I was talking about. Bounces me around the various people in the Pentagon. I finally get to the, the bowels of the E-ring in the Pentagon to this Marine colonel who was in charge of urban warfare planning. Perfect. This guy will appreciate what my invention was all about. I was excited. I introduced myself. My name is Steve Poisoner. I am CEO of SnapTrack. We've invented a way to embed a GPS receiver into a cell phone. This is a big invention. We think there's all kinds of soldier tracking applications. Can we fly out to the Pentagon and show you? I'll never forget this. Pause. Silence. Nothing. Finally, he says, in this very slow cadence, I do not need the help of a bunch of snot-nosed kids from Silicon Valley. I was pretty stunned. I didn't know why, what to say, so I shot back. Colonel, I challenge you to a duel. Let's get together and let's test the best soldier tracking technology that we have, that you, the military has versus the snap track system, see which one's better. More silence. Finally, he says, you're on. Three weeks later, the colonel shows up in San Francisco at Pier 39 for nothing less than a showdown. He was in this unmarked RV, you know, you know, Pier 39, the tourist area there, parked at the curb. This wasn't any normal RV. It was customized. He had st they had stripped out all of the furniture and the beds and the kitchen, and they had these workstations in this RV. And there were these soldiers sitting in front of computer monitors at these workstations. One of the computer monitors had an electronic street map of San Francisco on there. And they had these blinking dots. One, one was a green dot representing the location of the military tracking system. And the red dot that was blinking was the location of the snap track system. And we were going to have a comparison. He had designed a test route through San Francisco. Now, representing the US Marine Corps was this corporal, Marine corporal. He was 20 years old, and he was, he was big. Six foot six, muscular, buff, in great shape, as you would expect you know, a Marine to be. Strapped to his back was this big backpack stuffed with electronic gear with this big whip antenna coming out the top. That was the best the military had you know, 15 some odd years ago. Now, uh, representing Team Snap Track was one of my very best engineers, and his name was Howie. Howie was 40 years old, and the last time Howie had exercised was, well, back in high school. <laughs> Howie had our latest snap track prototype built inside of a Marlboro cigarette box, which he had stuffed inside of his shirt pocket. That's pretty cool. The two of them leave the RV. Out into the streets of San Francisco they go to test the system. The colonel and I, we huddle around the computer monitor with the two blinking dots. For the first 10 minutes, everything's going fantastic. The red dot and the green dot tracking side by side as they were going into, the, into San Francisco. Then all of a sudden, the, 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 the green dot representing the Marine Corps started to pull out way far in front of the red dot. And finally, the red dot comes to a grinding halt. And what is going on? The colonel at this point has this big, huge grin on his face. And he points at me and says, Poisoner, looks like you have a problem on your hands. I start to sweat. I pick up a cell phone. I call up Howie. I said, Howie, what the heck is going on? Howie tells me that he and the Marine turn up one of those famous San Francisco streets with the big hill. About halfway up, Howie tells me that he runs completely out of breath and has to stop at a Starbucks for a mocha latte. Fortunately, the cafe, the caffeine kicks in. Howie gets up, completes th what he perceives to be an obstacle course. The technology performs really well. And to the colonel's credit, he writes this glowing report about how powerful this, this SnapTrack invention is. I take that report back to Sand Hill Road. This time, I get a much better reception. It took a few years to take our little prototype and shrimp it, and shrink it down to a chip with a lot of help from venture capital. Then Qualcomm acquires the company and takes the chip and, and, and 
reduces it to some little millimeter of silicon that runs on, on, a, on a chip that is in every cell phone already, dropping the price of a high-performance GPS receiver to less than a penny. There's now two billion SnapTrack-enabled cell phones on the market today. We've saved thousands of lives with the technology in emergency situations, and we're really quite proud of it. Now, the lessons learned, uh, it, th we creating value in your investments is all about entrepreneurship and encouraging great entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs, you know, need to be very nimble because things don't go smoothly, not in any startup. And great entrepreneurs surround themselves with very talented, diverse teams of people. And great entrepreneurs turn out to be great listeners, too. So uh, what I've found is that great companies are built by wonderful teams of diverse entrepreneurs who team up with long-term investors because none of this is possible without the capital coming in a predictable time and having investors that have the understanding and patience that things don't go in a straight line in startups. So I'll, I'll let me just wrap up with a prediction that Ted, Ted's asked for what's going to happen in the next 10 years. And Vivek had some really interesting predictions about some of the future technological dis, uh, disruptions coming. My prediction has to do with geography. Now, I've lived in Silicon Valley for 30 some odd years, as I've mentioned. I love Silicon Valley. Uh, met my wife in Silicon Valley, raised a family there, went to school in Silicon Valley. But I'm here to tell you that Silicon Valley is almost completely saturated. It's now twice as expensive to start a company in Silicon Valley than just a few years ago. My prediction is this, that Silicon Valley will saturate in the next 10 years. It's, it's almost there already. And Southern California will emerge as the next great tech hub. That's really great news, not only for Silicon Valley, but for the entire state of California to have another major tech hub outside of just Silicon Valley. And it's really great news for the country and the world because Southern California, which I may have time to talk about a little bit later, is sitting on so much intellectual property that it has just a great opportunity for it to emerge as really a world-class tech hub. Gladly, Lou. So over to you. <coughs> I could really sit here to listen. <laughs> Those are really <laughs> terrific tales. Uh, <coughs> Uh, like Vivek, I was also born and raised in China. <coughs> Came here as a, as a young student uh, <coughs> at the time uh, that uh, uh, really I was, it wasn't my choice. <laughs> I was I was forced to escape from China, <laughs> so I got here. You were prepared, didn't know anybody, didn't speak the language, but somehow can miraculous. You, can you share your story, please? <laughs> well, that's, a, yes. that's a longer one. No, no, you have to <laughs> <laughs> this is this has a hero. You need to hear yeah, no, that's no, okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Google them and look it up. <laughs> anyway, thank you. <laughs> he stood up thank for you. the thanks. Yeah, Th thank you. Um, so uh, <coughs> anyway, so so I ca came here and and but but uh, you know w I was just most fortunate to get uh, <coughs> into a language program at Columbia and then uh <coughs> and then finally got accepted into the normal program. Uh, but I was looking, you know, I grew up in a communist China, and really, <coughs> there, there wasn't really any money around or no businesses. And so, so I have no idea how to survive. And, uh, uh, and so I ask all my students, <laughs> fellows, how do I really make money to pay back on my loans, <laughs> which looks astronomical to me. Uh, I'm sure Vivek appreciates <laughs> coming from India or China. So... And then one day, this is maybe a year after I got into school, so one of my classmates <coughs> uh, said, look, you know, there's the, sh uh, take, you know, hand me a, 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 a flyer, basically said, you know, look, <coughs> to listen to this guy, you know, this, they're talking about uh, uh, making money, you should really <coughs> be interested. So I took a look and said, there is something about investment uh, over free lunch. I said, that's good. <laughs> I like free lunch as a poor student. So I went there, and there was no lunch anywhere. And uh, so I was asking, where is the lunch? Where is the buffet? He said, well, now that guy is standing there. His name is buffet. <laughs> it was turn. It was Warren Buffett. <laughs> of course, I couldn't tell the differences between one T or two T. <laughs> so I thought it was a Mr. Buffet. Uh, so I said, well, I'm here <laughs> as well to sit through that. But whatever uh, Mr. Buffett said that day really fundamentally changed my life. And for the first time, I thought, gee, this is something I could do. And the method he laid out is something I think I can follow, <laughs> even if I know nothing about business. 
Uh, so I spent uh, the following year uh, researching everything about uh, Buffett, Munger, and Berkshire, and uh, and then bought my first stock. <coughs> this is 25 years ago, and so 25 years later, I've yet to find another professional calling or another uh, <laughs> role model. <laughs> so I guess I'm really incredibly blessed. Uh, and so, and, and then as soon after I got out of school, uh, I was able to pay back the loans and um, have enough of a, of a fund that I thought I could work for myself. So <laughs> anyway, so Ward always said that uh, you know, when, when, when we ask him about um, professional advice, he said, look, you gotta really uh, you know, <coughs> choose a profession you're passionate about and work for a guy that you admire most. So I said, okay, I'll become self-employed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I work for myself. Uh, that's, that's how I started. Uh, this is now 20 years later. Uh, and along the way <coughs> uh, that I, I sort of always have a little bit of entrepreneurial buck, and so I, I figure I can probably also uh, start a few companies as an investor as well. Mm, so we actually funded a dozen or so startup technology companies out of the in the east air I mean the east coast from Boston, New York, uh, Toronto, uh, and and so that's really <laughs> where I come to face is technology, uh, and of course half of the things we invest in failed within the first year, <laughs> and the other half turned out to be really a tough long slog. <coughs> that really lasts for years. And of course, uh, that <laughs> Steve said is right. Uh, no, nothing really is what, uh, what you plan to. <laughs> Everything changed multiple times. Uh, and you need a lot of a luck in between. Uh, in the end, uh, you know, when all said, is all said and done, we did okay. Uh, <coughs> but from that experience, I also uh, gained some insight about this whole process of creative destruction. You know, technologies are wonderful creative forces, but for every trillion that we were talking about created, there's got to be another trillion destroyed in the process. So as an investor in the end, uh, what you're really looking is a choice, a balanced of choices, and if that choice is wrong, if you're on the other side, uh, the result is just horrible. <coughs> you should be afraid of all the changes. And not everybody's right, and, and in fact, nobody's always <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so what do you do as an investor, uh, especially a large investor like CalPERS, uh, that are really, uh, although located here, but in, in a sense, uh, it's hard to have that expertise to predict whether Steve's company would end up in all the cell, f cell phone or other people's. For every success, there have got to be another 100 failures. This is why all the VCs, uh, <coughs> you know, in the end, end up becoming hot no hard nosed because that's how they survive, and it's a survivor bias. So, if you look at the uh, <coughs> the actual result for the 25 years that I've been in the investment business, especially the 20 years I've been running the fund, uh, the overall return worldwide on equity works out just about between six to seven percent. Now, <laughs> for all this tales of exponential growth, so where the numbers show up, that's where the numbers show up, when you average out, in a sense. <coughs> when, you, when you talk about the creation and the destruction, you work out the average and the overall result, that's what you end up. And so what you do is that if you really want to be kept up with the time, you first really get that return by invest uh, no fee um, index. This is where I applauded the uh, the uh, <coughs> the work of uh, of uh, Carl Pers uh, led by the leadership Ted Marcy and all the teams uh, of really having a low fee index. Uh, let's first to get to the overall result, and then we can see whether we can actually improve on top of it and picking the people who can pick the w winners, or we can really learn enough to build the core expertise that we can pick uh, winners to really improve on that. 
Uh, but you should really set expectation realistically at the beginning, <coughs> not really go to the moons. <laughs> because for every attempt of going to the moons, you could really uh, basically <laughs> go all the way down to hell. <laughs> so, and, and many people did that. So uh, that come back to the uh, <coughs> lessons we learned, I learned from the approach of uh, <coughs> Berkshire Value Investor from Ben Graham. Buffet and Munger, and which is what we really try to apply over the last 20 years. First, you have to really <coughs> uh, align your interests right. Uh, um, that uh, We always have a philosophy that we have to make the arrangement with the investors in a way that if we were switched in our position, I'll be most delighted to take the other side. And if that's the case, then uh, I think you would be delighted to invite other people to join. And so that's when, when Warren started, he has this compensation formula, which we now call Buffett formula, that uh, no management fee, and the first uh, 6% is free. And then they take a quarter on an annual compounded basis, and then they take a quarter of profit share on top of the 6% annualized return. And they also <coughs> invest all of his money in the fund, nothing outside. And so his interest and his investors is exactly the same. So when I took <coughs> uh, start of my, I basically just copied. So <laughs> we basically practiced the same thing for 20 years uh, that, that no management fee, 6% annualized for free, and then we shared a quarter on top of it. And so compare that uh, with a, a hedge fund that take uh, one or two percent from the top for doing nothing, basically. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then the minute they become positive return, even positive one percent, they take 20 <laughs> percent. I wonder, where is the logic? And that's why I, I, really, I really do applaud the work of health force in leading to rationalize uh, the payment system, the incentive system. At least to incentivize to do the job right, because everybody can you can put on long-term equity, your uh, your time horizon is so long you would be able to get the long-term average equity return worldwide, and it works out over the last twenty years since I had this fund. Uh, S and P is about seven point two, Europe is about six point five, and Asia is about six. You can get that one. They basically uh, put into the index fund with no fee, basically. And then if you do on top of that one, you share a little bit, that just makes sense. So in other words, you would come back to the first rule we follow, which is that we make the arrangement uh, that if our position is a switch from the investor, we'll be delighted to take the other side. And that's just to make nothing but sense. And so till this day, I still have 100% of my net worth into my own fund. <laughs> I have, n have a not a single dollar in investment outside. We intend to keep it that way. And the other thing is we, uh, we, we, we treat the stocks uh, we own as a piece of ownership of the business involved. And we buy them at a price that give us a margin of safety. And uh, we basically... Uh, uh, in the sense, use market as a uh, as a yes, useful tool instead of an instructor to tell us what to do. Uh, so we're contrary in a sense. And then we spend almost all our time to basically build up expertise in the small areas that we can really have a what we call the circle of competence, which is critically important for investing. Because investing is really predict about what will happen in the future which inherently is unpredictable. So what you get is a statistical odds. And to be a successful investor, you want to really <coughs> bet when the odds is overwhelmingly in your favor, in a sense, and have a reasonable diversification. So that's the way <coughs> that you can do. So what you do is you spend all your time through hard study to gain a little bit of, of knowledge and insight into a particular area which you would have called it a circle of a competence. But the whole concept of a circle of a competence is the edge of it. Because if without an edge, there isn't much of a circle. <laughs> so <laughs> in other words, if you don't know what you don't know, 
you really probably don't know what you think you know. So in a sense, uh, that can only gain over a very long time of a patient, persistent study. And you want to really choose to study those companies are likely to give you a long-term high compounding return, because compounding return is really a miracle. It's absolutely nothing short of a miracle. And Vivek was talking about uh, the uh, evo evolution of a civilization. It's in fact, that the whole concept of a, of a company return never registered in human mind until about 200 years ago, because nothing that we experienced until then have the characteristic of long-term compounding growth, whether it's in nature or in life. Everything after a while becomes directionless or reversal. So it's more of a cycle that is a more more kind of resonant to our own day-to-day -day experiences. The truly long-term growth only happens after the Industrial Revolution. So in other words, if you look at the stock market since the invention of it is in about, I would say, 200 years or so since we have data, a dollar <coughs> during that period of time, if you hold it in, you know, people think it's safe cash, it would only reduce to about five cents because of the inflation over uh, 200 years, even a small inflation will reduce <coughs> your value from a dollar to five cents. You lost, in other words, 95. And if you invest into fixed income, and then you probably really <coughs> at a reasonable rate, you would grow quite a bit. In fact, over 200 years, tens of a thousands times, which is enormous, but if you inf Investing in the stock even give you six, seven percent of a return over that period of time. Your dollar almost goes to a million. That's how powerful long-term compounding return is. So if a pension like Kaufman's really truly have the long-term horizon, you should, because your horizon should be forever, as long as that you know, the state is run properly <laughs> under John's leadership. The state uh, should really have another, you know, few decades, a few hundred years. And of course, the employee will be here no matter what technological change will happen, you'll be there. And if you really just invest in the basket of, of, of the, uh, of the, uh, 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 of, of index, you should really have that index return. And that index return over a couple hundred years is a million times. It's a huge. And not investing obviously carries a much bigger risk. And then, uh, and then, so if you can find that there's a long-term higher compounders, because in the long run, your uh, investment return in the stock should approximate what are the underlying company would return for their own invested capital? And so if you invest in companies that are capable of long-term higher compounding return, your result would be better than that average. And so if you spend the time study that one, you choose a market where you have enduring competitive advantage and also less competition, then your result will be better. So over the 20 years uh, since we have been running uh, uh, Himalaya Capital, our compound return is over 50 times in 20 years. That works out to be about three to three and a half times uh, the rate of average return. So it can be done. That in selected managers can be accomplished in every asset classes, including venture capital. They're certainly better entrepreneurs than the average entrepreneurs. And we have uh, two excellent uh, examples sitting on the panel. And they're also certainly better venture capital investors than the average. And I think we are <laughs> sitting with a few here too. Uh, and in every asset class, it's the same thing. But the approach should be pretty much the same. You still have to really, over a patient, long-term study, gain a few insights. You still have to carefully define your circle of competence so that uh, you know the edge of it. You do not step outside the mesh. And the market is almost designed to punish you every time you step outside. 
Every time you want to be greedy, every time you pretend to know what you don't know, every time you begin to do foolish things, you get punished. And that's what the market is almost designed for. So, but if you take that patient and, and uh, rational approach, that no matter what happens in this huge uh, technological disruption, you're likely to be the beneficiary rather than the other end. And that's the whole goal of investment, is to be the beneficiary of this onslaught of changes that nobody can stop. But really choose carefully in a way that you are the benefit, beneficiary of it rather than being punished. That's the whole point. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's so much in that, uh, both in terms of the necessity to find skilled and um, um, educated uh, investors uh, and entrepreneurs to take advantage is a difficult uh, skill set uh, to, uh, to pick out, uh, and then achieving alignment along the way. Let me, let me turn a little bit to a uh, turn now. I want to talk about particular industries and or geographies. And um, you know, maybe, uh, Steve, I'll start uh, with you to talk about this advantage that you see in Southern California right now. And uh, Lee Lu, I'll come back to you to talk about what you see in China. And then Vivek, I'll come back to you to you, you pick them on industries and geographies. <laughs> yeah, there, so Steve, why don't we start? Great. So how many people from Southern California here? Awesome. So I, I've spent most of my life in Silicon Valley, except for the last few years I lived in, in Southern California and San Diego, lo loved it down there, and became really aware of the amazing amount of intellectual property creation that happens in Southern California that's really underutilized. This is a fantastic opportunity for the state of California. Uh, first of all, uh, even though two-thirds of the people of the state of California live in Southern California, if you compare the amount of entrepreneurial activity that happens in Southern California uh, compared to Silicon Valley, it's still apples and oranges. Silicon Valley is on a different planet. Here's a few statistics. Twice the number of startups occur in Silicon Valley than in all of Southern California combined. There's eight times the amount of growth capital going into startups in Silicon Valley than in all of Southern California, four times the amount of venture capital, uh, twice the number of IPOs, 20 times the IPO value in Silicon Valley than in all of Southern California. So Silicon Valley is definitely in a, in a space by itself. But as I mentioned earlier, that's likely going to change because, honestly, Google, Facebook, and Apple squeezing the lifeblood out of Silicon Valley. Not intentionally, it's just that they're growing at such a rapid clip and they have no competitors in the foreseeable future. They're going to continue to hire engineers by the thousands. The mayor of Palo Alto the other day held a press conference and said, please do not come here anymore. It's really the place is full. Traffic, I can get from my home in Los Gatos to LA faster than I can drive from Los Gatos to San Francisco. So there's, it's just the fact. And so the question for California is, are, are startups gonna spill over into Bend, Oregon, or Salt Lake City, or Austin, Texas? Or are we gonna keep them here in California like what would be a fantastic result? Southern California. Despite the fact that the amount of entrepreneurial activity is not super high, the, I mentioned the amount of research and intellectual property creation is amazing. The, the, uh, there's more engineers graduating from Southern California universities than any other region in the country. More PhDs come out of Southern California universities than any other region. 80 Nobel Prize winners in Southern California. So what we've done is we formed a not-for-profit to pull together Southern California's fragmented forces. And th that's what keeps Southern California from really emerging is because it's so dispersed and fragmented. So we have this new not-for-profit, and Ted's been an advisor. It's called the Alliance for Southern California Innovation. And we've recruited every major university to be on the board. Now, I, I should have known, maybe, I, maybe you all know, Universities in Southern California do not like each other. These are huge rivalries. <laughs> and the fact that they've all come together around this is an important signal that Southern California is getting serious about becoming the next great tep hu tech hub. We have all five UC campuses that, that in Southern California on our board. We have Caltech, we have USC, we have Harvey Mudd, University of San Diego. We have the president of Qualcomm, the president of PIMCO, senior executives from Disney and Warner Brothers. 
we have a, a great group now all devoted to this mission of supercharging Southern California's tech ecosystem. And I, I think it's not that far away. A lot of the pieces are there. Just needs some more attention from some of the great investors. And as, as Silicon Valley really starts to fill up, we plan to really market, brand Southern California to these great investors around California and around the country to really start to focus on Southern California. And then we, we, we b do believe it will take off. Can, can I, can I, uh, can I kind of defend Silicon Valley? Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh. No, I think, uh, I, I think, you know, it's kind of interesting because part of Civilization 3.0 I think we're moving, the, the concept of countries I is actually a new new concept, and it's only a few hundred uh, years old. And before countries, you know, uh, we had, uh, rather than nation states, we had city states. Uh, and so right now, I know from personal experience that the mayor of Sacramento has more power to effect change than, than the head of a country. And so the future is really about back to city states and even mega regions. And we live in the most prolific, powerful mega region, maybe in history. And the way I look at our mega region is it goes uh, from, you know, south of San Jose all the way to Sacramento. And when I, uh, when I uh, bought the Kings four years ago, um, I went to the downtown mall and there was not a soul there. It was, it was empty. You could have thrown a bowling ball and it wouldn't have hit anyone. Uh, it was one of the worst uh, real estate markets in, in, in the country. And, you know, we put like a billion dollars downtown and, and we've created, you know, tens of thousands of jobs and uh, now the place is booming again. So I actually think that the answer to some of what you were saying, the saturation, I, I do believe that the Sacramento area is one of the options and we're starting to see that. We're seeing uh, companies uh, moving into, into that area. You know, obviously, Southern California is also a great uh, hub, and you know, I'm, we're investing in companies uh, coming out out of there. Uh, but I just don't want to count out uh, Silicon Valley uh, and our mega region. I think that yes, it is get, it is getting crowded, uh, but I think the answer to that could actually be Sacramento. <laughs> Rebuttal? No, actually, uh, of course, Sacramento is, is <laughs> very interesting area as well. Let me just say though that I, if if you live in Silicon Valley you recognize the saturation all around you. Uh, nurses, firefighters, police officers that protect Google cannot live within two hours of Google. S Silicon Valley is going through a tale of two cities. You're either a mega wealthy investor or, or tech entrepreneur, or you're struggling, struggling big time. And, and you just have to do a cost comparison. We did have the help of the Boston Consulting Group to analyze what does it take to run a startup you know, in Silicon Valley now and it's just incredibly off the scale high, you know, because a starting salary for an engineer uh, it, that Google, you know, goes after is $200,000 plus free dry cleaning. Anyhow, I mean, it's, it's, it's very expensive uh, to now hire engineers, and the, and the unemployment rate in Silicon Valley for engineers is, you know, zero. Let's turn to a, di a, a, a different geography. Uh, let's look at China. So we talked about Google and uh, and Amazon, but we could also talk about Alibaba and Baidu and Tencent. You know, it's a huge continent with an enormous consumer base and uh, enormous amount of attention devoted to technological innovation. Uh, how would you assess sort of the landscape uh, in China and, and compared to uh, the United States? Yeah. <coughs> so uh, China is really worth uh, the attention, especially for serious long-term investors. Uh, 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 for a couple of a different reason. Now, this year will mark the 40th anniversary since China started the market reform. Over the last 40 years, the Chinese economy <coughs> has, again, we're going back to the concept of a compounding return. <laughs> so compounding in real term, uh, net of inflation, uh, 9 to 10 percent, which really lifted the Chinese GDP several hundred times. And uh, as a result, now it's the second largest economy. And uh, most people would agree that it's just a matter of time that China will become the largest economy. And it has now somewhat slowed from the hyper growth uh, period for the first three decades, the routinely on the double digit. Now we're probably settled somewhere around six, seven percent. 
but that is still two, three times faster than any other large economy. And one of the things that driving that, ref uh, that uh, faster pace of, a reform I mean of economic development is technology. So because China is catching from behind, it has a few advantages. Um, for example, on the telephone line, they just entirely bypass the fixed line and goes to, um, <coughs> goes to the uh, 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 smartphone. Now today China has 750 million smartphone users that connected to the internet. That's multiple times of the population <laughs> we have in this country. <laughs> and also I have one of the best technological infrastructure in a sense. Um, and uh, in terms of the, uh, the specific uh, regions, uh, <coughs> for example, that you know, we talk about Silicon Valley came to prominence uh, that um, over the last uh, few decades since the invention of a semiconductor. Uh, similarly, you know, 35 years ago, Shenzhen was, um, uh, was a small fishing ri village with uh, less than 30,000 people. Today, uh, it is a metropolis of 12 million people, GDP of three, four hundred billion dollars, uh, and the home of uh, some of the most innovative, globally competitive companies in the whole world, basically. Tencent's market cap is a 500 billion. It's only kind of uh, comparable for Facebook, or mm. Google, Amazon. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, and there are several others. Uh, and in terms of their muscles, uh, for example, Huawei is another company based in Shenzhen. Mm. Their capital uh, spending on research last year will be approximately about 15 billion. That is more uh, than any other of the rest of, of the uh, uh, telecom equipment providers combined, basically. And, um, and then on Semiconductor, which made the Silicon Valley famous, uh, Samsung uh, spent last year on capital 40 billion US dollars. And that is a way more than all the other Silicon <laughs> Valley based technology semiconductor company spent in combined. So the center of a gravity is moving both because of a capital, because that's where the talent as well as the consumer are. And on top of that, you have a very strong government support was determined to build out their infrastructure to make the technological innovation easier. For example, China is building uh, the massive high-speed railroad across the country, and China now has 20,000 kilometers of a high-speed railroad uh, uh, that is a three times faster than here, and is uh, they have a more, again, uh, of a high-speed railroad mileage than the rest of the world combined, and they're still building at a very, very high pace. Uh, uh, and so, so in a certain area, they're catching up. Certain area, they have an advantage from backward. And in certain area, they're actually leading. Uh, take an example of, for example, digital payment. Uh, and digital payment is really invented here, in a sense, uh, with a PayPal to facilitate online purchases. And it's been growing very fast. I would uh, say this year number we haven't seen, uh, but probably in the in the neighborhood of a couple hundred billion, because 2016 is 112 billion, if I recall. So call that a doubling again, maybe is 200 billion, which is a lot that we feel very proud. But in China last year, in 2017, there are altogether nine trillion U.S. dollar payment pass through cell phones, digital payment, nine trillion US dollars. <laughs> that is a gigantic percentage. <laughs> multiple, multiple factors bigger than the United States. As a result, it enabled different industries that are previously, it's unthinkable here. For example, the bike sharing businesses, <coughs> that you can really kind of rent a bag, uh, basically using your cell phone, you just kind of mm, do a QR payment and drop anywhere and pick up anywhere. And so, but we can't do here. 
we have to use a dock <coughs> uh, station because that's how we really track, that's how we pay. It's the same thing if we're stuck with a credit card. We need to have a cash payment. We need to have a people manning the shops. Whereas in China now, we have a beginning of a proliferation of basically <coughs> stores with no human anywhere. Everything was through face recognition. All the payment is uh, through the <coughs> QR code on your cell phone, and it will be tracked. So you don't need any salespeople. You don't need to check out. You don't need a line. You just pick up and you swipe, and that's it. That industry is hard to imagine here because the basic infrastructure is not there. I take another example, electric cars. Electric cars, you need a charging stations. It's a chicken and egg. With all the charging stations, people will be reluctant to buy the electric cars. But without enough charging stations, manufacturers will be reluctant to build them. And what really come down to is this central concept, that a free market is neither three, free, no really come naturally. Free market is perhaps the most expensive public good anywhere in the whole world. If you look at the entire history of industrial revolution until today, government always taking an active role in fostering <coughs> the free market, the marketplace before it can take off. This is really why you need infrastructure. This is why you need the public role. And so China is building on a massive scale of infrastructure, um, of, of charging stations for electric cars. In the next uh, three years, they're gonna do 12 million. Guess what? Electric car is most likely gonna first to become the mainstream automobile <coughs> uh, mobility <coughs> in China as a result of that one. And so, so in, in examples of examples, we see a confluence of, of, of combining forces in moving in dir one direction. You have a billion people determined to get rich, to move faster. You have a government that is very supportive and pro-businesses and investing wisely on the basic infrastructure needed to foster that change. And on top of it, you have those technological changes that are really giving people from coming behind the equal opportunity or sometimes even an edge to move forward. So all of the forces are coming together are really propelling this revolution of a technology happening both in Asia and the United States. Now we have a two dual centers, <coughs> equally strong, equally powerful, all moving forward in the same direction. In fact, it's a competition. And they're really helping each other to really stimulating each other to move forward in lockstep. And that's good. As a global investor, as an investor who should be a global investor, it's a good thing. So not only you should take advantage of at least the average result of the technological change, you should take advantage of the average result of the global technological changes. So having China to be part of the program is critically important. Any European investors really missed out when the United States on the rise missed out at their own expenses. And hopefully the U.S. investor would not really make the same mistake. Well, thank you. Uh, Priya, we, were, we have about, I think, uh, a little less than 10 minutes left. I want to make sure to bring it back to you for any questions and answers. I've got many more questions. <laughs> I could be here for a few more hours. But I'm not uh, sure we, we really we'll uh, let uh, Mr. Ranadive yep. give his comments. Maybe we'll yep. let, let you, if you have Industries, something more to add on this question, we'll give you another few minutes and then we'll yeah, turn it over. Sure, so just a couple of things and, you know, uh, relating to what you were saying, uh, Lulu. Uh, it's interesting because if you look at the 100,000 years of human uh, history, uh, our standard of living was actually surprisingly flat for mo most of it. And w it really took off with free trade and technology. So it's to your point. 
uh, I think, you know, just this amazing things happening right now uh, in the universities. And I'll just mention a few that I believe will be uh, trillion dollar industries in the future. Uh, at uh, UC Berkeley, a, 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 a lady, Jennifer, uh, figured out uh, through looking at yogurt uh, a way to uh, edit genes. It's called CRISPR-Cas9. It's also uh, been done at MIT. And so literally, you're going to be able to cut and paste gene sequences. You're going to be uh, able to eliminate uh, genetic disorders. Uh, you're going to be able to create uh, new forms of, uh, of life. You could say, I want a peanut that doesn't cause allergies, and you're going to be able to create that. Uh, so that's, that's going to be a trillion dollar industry. Uh, you know, in uh, Southern California and also uh, uh, at Berkeley and other places, uh, as well as in China and Korea, uh, they've been experimenting uh, with a material called uh, graphene, and that's going to be another trillion dollar industry. Uh, it's uh, atom thick. And uh, it's going to eventually, when they figure out how to make it in, in volume, it's going to be used as uh, on your cell phone covers, screens. Uh, you're going to make airplanes, cars, bicycles, uh, ice hockey sticks out of it. Um, batteries. batteries, everything just about. We're looking at a company right now where uh, they're going to eliminate the, the water problem. I was with, uh, 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 with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel a few weeks ago. And he was talking about their, uh, they're the leaders in, in uh, desalination. Uh, and I didn't have the heart to tell him that with graphene, it could make all that obsolete. Uh, because we're looking at a company right now where literally you can take seawater and pour it, and sweet water will come out of it. And so you know, that's going to be a trillion dollar uh, industry. Uh, machine learning, deep machine learning, it applies to every sector. It applies, uh, we're looking at companies uh, that do a better job of reading uh, MRIs. Uh, than humans do. They do it faster. They do it uh, cheaper. They do it actually with greater accuracy. And the FDA is starting to come to grips with uh, some of these companies and is giving them clearance. Um, another area that uh, is going to be huge is, is bacteria. And so your gut bacteria, people are saying now, can pretty much, uh, it, it, just about every disease, including things like Alzheimer's, uh, people are saying, are related to your gut bacteria. So that's going to be another trillion dollar industry. So this is uh, just, th th there's never been a more exciting time to be alive than today. In the next 10 or 15 years, we're going to see the emergence of these uh, multi-trillion dollar industries. Thank you. Well, I imagine that there are some questions from the board. This has been a really stimulating panel. Any thoughts? Everyone's ready for a break. Do you have any final questions? Oh, did, did you have something, John? No. Could you just use your mic, sir? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you elaborate more on the, the state of the advancement of research in regards to what you just referenced in regards to water? Yeah, so, uh, so this company that we're looking at, it's actually a company out of Korea. Uh, and a lot of these technologies, as Lilu said, are coming out of Asia, by the way. And so countries like China and Korea are investing heavily, heavily in, in these, and they're often world leaders. Uh, so they're actually uh, very close to starting a pilot in Vietnam uh, with the country of Vietnam to uh, look at how they can help uh, uh, clean uh, provide clean water. That, as you know, is a big problem in, in much of the uh, developing world. I'll Thank have you. one yeah. other one when, when we have a you couple minutes. Please. So maybe a lightning round, uh, public yep. versus private markets. You know, we've seen incredibly uh, substantial investment in venture capital. It's, it's grown from $15 billion to $86 billion over the last uh, 20 years. But at the same time, the number of IPOs into the public market has declined substantially. Uh, venture firms are staying, uh, portfolio companies are staying private much longer uh, longer periods of time, the, you know, over a hundred unicorns, you know, billion-dollar uh, private companies. Just a lightning round on the advantage to the private uh, markets over the course of the next 15 years versus the public markets, the health of the public markets. Any thoughts? All three of you have straddled pr public and private markets in your career. Yeah, I think this is a huge opportunity for you guys, Ted, uh, because as a guy who ran a public company, the uh, it's become very difficult with activists, and you know, as you. As I think you said, they're thinking short term, and you know we have to think long term. And so, 
uh, there's fewer and fewer public companies to invest in. Um, many companies maybe shouldn't be public or you know, they really can't be public in this environment. But I also think that the private equity model is broken and you know, I think we're kind of, private equity 1.0 was just doing financial engineering, leveraging a balance sheet. You know, 2.0 was operational engineering, cutting costs. And now I'm starting to see a lot of companies that have uh, exchanged ownership among the uh, private equity guys and I think it's time to 3 uh, what I refer to as imagination engineering. How can you actually grow revenues and create new products? And so I think uh, there's a huge role for you guys to play in helping this next generation of companies uh, keep, keep uh, innovating and keep growing. That uh, as VCs e you know, evolve into private equity players, since you know, companies aren't going public as fast and they turn into these large private equity investors, that, that is creating a gap for early stage investment. Uh, it's, it's harder and harder to get Series A investment now as the VCs are preoccupied with these much larger investments. And so there's a, there's a need in the marketplace for that early stage investment because you, you, know, you can never get to the, these great companies if you can't get through that Series A round. And right now I, I, see, I see, with the help of the Boston Consulting Group's work, there definitely holes in the market there. Mr. Liu, did you want to add anything to that question? Okay. I, I had one, qu oh sorry, d Mr. Miller, did you have a question? No, okay. I had one question actually, if I could, before before bringing this to a close, and that is we've, we've been hearing a lot more about e-waste and the challenges that that poses to communities and also just managing it is, is challenging. How is how, how are you seeing that being thought about in the technology sector, particularly as obsolescence rates seem to be increasingly rapid? Is that something you're all thinking about at all? Yeah, e waste, so, so for example, devices are being, people are replacing their devices very frequently and it's, they're throwing them away or they're, how are they, how they're getting e waste? Yes, yeah, sorry if I wasn't clear. Um, so, how, how are, you, how is the industry looking at that as a, is, is it looking at that as, a, as an issue that's facing the industry itself in terms of survival or as a, as a risk factor? Yeah, I think I, you know, I, I think it's something that, that needs to be looked at. I think that people are so focused on you know, as we saw with the, with the, you know, just the awful Apple story recently, that uh, you know people are so focused on selling the next thing uh, that I think it's an area that the state actually, uh, you know, I think we need you know we need state and you know, federal government 3.0 as well. And I think California, and I've talked to the governor about this, could lead in some of these areas and, uh, you know, just drones and, and robots and, uh, and what we could be doing. Uh, and this would be another one. So I think that this is something that our state should take the lead in. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mizzi. I, I guess just from your vantage point, um, and you talked a little bit about um, certainly opportunities that we ought to be, you know, keeping an open mind about. But with respect to some of the challenges um, uh, with regard to uh, other areas of the economy that um, could likely be disrupted, and I'm really thinking about the human capital aspect. And um, so I, I guess the role of government in your mind, um, how do we look at our role? Is it a new role with respect to um, what we do relative to things like education, job training? And then on the privacy front, uh, what are some challenges that we ought to be paying attention to? Yeah, so you know, one of the things that I've been uh, doing is I've been challenging the UCs and saying to them, uh, you know, it, what is UC 3.0? So if you think about education, it hasn't changed in the last couple of hundred years. And you know, if you own a Tesla, while you're sleeping, it gets upgraded. If you go to UC, you go there four years and there's no more upgrades and that's the end of it. And so, so we need to be thinking, we need to be rethinking education, we need to be rethinking of it as a continuous lifelong process. And uh, I know that when I used to speak to, when Obama was the president and he was very committed to, to community colleges and then using them uh, as, a, as a way to, to provide that continuous education. So again, I think this is something that our state should take a leadership role in because uh, there's gonna be, uh, and, and, and I've been very pleasantly surprised. I've been challenging UC Davis uh, in terms of, you know, why don't you start 
teaching the subjects of the future. And I said, look, why don't you look at data analytics? I mean, that's a given that it's going to be really important. Uh, and uh, they very proudly told me that now they have a master's a graduate program in, in, in that. Uh, so I think the whole education system is, uh, we, we need to ask questions. You know, why does it have to be four years? And you know, why, uh, why is it the way it is? And what, how can we democratize uh, the process of learning so everybody has access to it uh, at, at a much lower cost? And I think that uh, the UCs are looking at that, as are other schools, I know MIT is, Stanford is. Uh, but I think this will actually hold the key to a lot of things. Now, I personally think that we have to do more than that, but that's just my view. There's some in Silicon Valley who uh, believe that this uh, concept of a, of a guaranteed basic income is not as crazy and socialist as it might seem, uh, because you know we are heading to a world where uh, machines will do much of the work. And so we have to be thinking about well, what does that mean for people and you know, how, how do we, uh, what, what does that mean for society? And I think those are all questions that need to be talked about. Thank you. Um, Mr. Slayton, yeah, I was Mr. Gonna, Miller, then Mr. Slayton. Excuse oh, me, sorry. I was going to just add to oh, that. Oh, I'm sorry, please. Yeah, go ahead. Real quick. Please do. Yeah, my last company was in the mobile education technology space. So that's sort of a tactical add on to the answer here. Uh, you know, when, you, when we send our kids to college, you know, we really personally don't want them to do it online from their bedroom. You want them to be in a dorm room to deal with lousy food and roommate issues and all those life experiences that they, they really need to have that you can't do online. It has to be face to face. But job training, on the other hand, that's a good fit for online education because a lot of people who need, need new skills, you know, have families and part time jobs or whatever, they're really busy but they're, they're sitting in the parking lot waiting to pick up their kids from soccer practice or wherever, they can whip out their iPad and, and do some work. So uh, the online education field, I think, is a great opportunity to address some of the, the job training challenges that we have. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Slayton. Uh, thank you. I just want to come back uh, just for a second to the investment side of this equation. So here we are. <clears throat> We're sitting here at 340, 350. What's the number today? 357, so 357 billion dollars, with a patient investor, which is perfect for the types of things that you do, but we are extremely risk adverse. So, what what would you be whispering in Ted's ear after this meeting, in terms of helping us deploy some of our capital that can both help some of these innovations occur, and also be a participant. In the, in the positive results of that? You know, I think that, uh, and I know, uh, well, I don't speak Chinese, but the word for, the symbol for danger and opportunity is, is the same, right? And so that's kind of the, the, for crisis and opportunity. And that's, that I think symbolizes your challenge right now. Uh, because, uh, you know, just about every industry is, is gonna get uh, disrupted and, uh, so what m m you might think of as being safe uh, could end up actually being quite uh, quite risky. Uh, and so I think you, know, you guys need to kind of get outside your comfort zone and uh, you know, do things uh, that, you know, you need to kind of think about what is, you know, what is investing 3.0 in terms of what you've done in the past and, and how it, it could change in the, in the future. And I think that uh, you know, being kind of the approach that Lilu mentioned, uh, it, it makes sense, but you also have to have in that uh, some future protection in terms of how the world is changing. And, uh, and I know that you know, we've talked to Ted about that, but I, I do think that we're sitting in, in a position where the world is going nonlinear. And uh, you know, the change uh, is gonna happen a lot faster than anyone could have expected. I would just add that you do get what you pay for when it comes to general partners. And that if you look at the venture capital asset class, uh, m the vast majority of returns come from the top tier venture capital investors. And, and th uh, a lot of people don't have the stomach to be a VC because a huge percentage of your investments do fail. And it takes a very special skill set to be a great investor like these guys here. Uh, and so I think it would be worth your while to think about how you can attract a, a, a higher quality 
venture capital general partner investor group, you know, who, who I guess historically has been scared away from you know wanting to spend a lot of time you know partnering with you all. And I, and I do think that you know all VCs aren't the same, and you have to figure out a way to get the very top folks investing some of your resources. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, my question, it's kind of hard to formulate, but in thinking about what Mr. Liu mentioned about having supportive government and what Priya mentioned about e-waste, and, and here we're dealing with a lot of the legacy of pollution, the legacy of challenges in environmental and industrial hygiene, and I'm a environmental regulator my whole career, and when I look out at there at the landscape, I see our regulatory infrastructure being 30, 40, or more years old and not really addressing the challenges of these new and emerging industries and materials and approaches. But when I look worldwide, I'm wondering, what do you see as the potential for some of the regulatory infrastructure in places like China or India to kind of leapfrog because they really never did quite get where we were 30 years ago, but these new challenges um, to kind of build the kind of regulatory infrastructure that provides them with the kind of worker and public health and environmental protections for this new generation of materials and technologies and not have to you know, develop a steel wheel railroad like we're still running on, but uh, while still dealing with the legacy waste. I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer your question. It's a great, damn great question. Uh, uh, in the early days of the development, obviously development trump everything else, and that is true in the West, and that is true in the early stage of the Chinese development. And as people really get reasonably uh, well off, and uh, the priority changes, and so safety becomes important, uh, safety of their food, the safety of the air they breathe, they all become important, so environmental protection become important. And so, uh, so that is the, uh, uh, one of the top, top government priority over the last few years, and presumably from now on into the future indefinitely. Uh, and so, and you're absolutely right that as the nature of industry changes, the nature of regulatory regime that really goes with it have to really adapt. Uh, and this is really uh, where it's becoming very difficult in terms of how, what is the uh, optimum way to design a government system that to really not only uh, be able to accommodate enough uh, to allow uh, technological innovation, but at the same time uh, protective enough <coughs> to really make sure <coughs> to prevent to the other side. And th that is, uh, th that has been the, the struggle from the beginning of a government <laughs> a few thousand years ago and will continue to be with us. And I don't think anyone has to figure out yet uh, what is the best way to do it. All I have to say is that a certain government do better than the others. And I have to point one good example. I would say that I think under Lee Kuan Yew, yeah, Singapore have done very well <coughs> in most of the critical, now it is tiny little city <laughs> for sure, but they have, um, have had deep thinking uh, into how to design to allow uh, that balance. Uh, uh, and I think they have achieved a quite, a, quite a wonderful balance. So there's a lot to be learned. I know that both US and China are also learning from their example and many other ones. I do think that in this age of globalization, I don't think anybody have a monopoly of all the wisdom as to what is the best way to govern, what's the best practice, what is the state of the art practices. And so <coughs> we have to be more objective, we have to be more open-minded 
we have to really be factual and objective enough to recognize when somebody's doing the right thing and say, this is something we can copy. And, and if we have that attitude, at least we're improving, we're not going backwards. <laughs> You know, I just, again, it goes back to my point earlier that uh, I think the real power now resides, it's back to the future with city-states. And even though the administration decided uh, to pull out of the Paris Accords, uh, you had our governor and a lot of people saying they wanted to stay in it. Uh, so in the city of Sacramento, when we <laughs> built the arena, uh, I challenged my folks to make it lead platinum. And we became the first arena in the world that uh, was lead platinum. It was uh, it's 100% solar powered. Uh, I get all the food from uh, a network of 700 farmers that are within a hundred mile radius. Uh, so I think the good news is that that our uh, kids are actually more aware of this, and I think that there is a lot of power that resides uh, within within cities and and, and local communities and. So even if you know we can't uh, get it done uh, at a at a federal level, there's a lot that can be done uh, within cities. Just just real quick, I, I was a regulator uh, recently, uh, and it, even in California, being you know the the capital of all this technology, a lot of the regulators here in California aren't all that modern in terms of the utilization of technology. I do think the state of California has a great opportunity to upgrade the regulatory infrastructure here you know, to keep up with all of the things that are, that are changing rapidly in the industries that they regulate. Thank you, and then Ms. Taylor has the last question and then we'll bring the I will try to make it brief. Thanks. I wanna thank you gentlemen for uh, coming today and it was a great presentation. So, and I wasn't gonna say anything until uh, uh, Mr. Rondi talked about the uh, universal wage or, or a living wage. Um, so, so what I guess the question that comes to my mind is how do you, if you're thinking that that's where we may go because of this, this disruption of jobs, how do you propose that we take a government that is, you know, based in capitalism and, and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and convince them that that is something we, we should be doing when so many people will be without work? And then I had a second question. Uh, how, if we are, uh, if Silicon Valley is saturated and we are looking at relocating, relo I love the fact that you like Sacramento because I'm, I'm a Sacramentan. <laughs> However, <laughs> I don't want to be, I'm a state employee. I don't want to be priced out of my home or my kids priced out of the uh, ability to buy a home. So how do you propose government intervene there before the, they, c you know, Silicon Valley comes to Sacramento or even to LA because LA is already really, really expensive. So how do we how do we avoid it being even more expensive? Yeah, I think uh, you know I, I think that helping people can take multiple forms, and so having uh, education that is uh, accessible and democratized, having healthcare that's democratized and accessible and inexpensive. Uh, so I think there's different ways of getting value to people, and I think. We're going to look at a, a lot of those ways. Uh, in terms of uh, just the other questions, I also think that you know the impact of technology, you know whether it's uh, high-speed trains like they have in China, and you know just imagine. I said this to the governor. I said, hey, you're trying to put a train between uh, LA and San Francisco. There's already a high-speed train. It's called Southwest. Why don't you, <laughs> why don't you put a high-speed train between Silicon Valley and and Sacramento, and you know that'll just completely light up the whole valley and because a lot of people do actually live closer to Sacramento and drive all the way to the si uh, to San Francisco and so uh, so I think there will be new modes of transportation think about when uh, when autonomous vehicles become uh, commonplace then uh, you know getting to places you, you, you know you could be it could be a working office and uh, you, you don't have to sit there and, and, and drive so I think that uh, I am uh, very very optimistic uh, that uh, while there will be some disruption, uh, I think uh, just like with any uh, change in era, uh, there will be short-term pain and short-term disruption. And I think we have to be uh, uh, kind and sensitive through that period. Uh, but what emerges, I think, is, uh, is amazing. 
Well, I really want to thank the panel for its insights. It's been a really engaging conversation. Um, so if everyone can join me in thanking the panel. And Ted, thank you for leading today's um, panels and conversations. Uh, I think they've set, helped set the tone for the work that we have before us in 2018 and beyond as we look at opportunities for our fund. We are going to take a break now. I'm going to make it a 12-minute break. I hope that's okay for everybody. We'll come back at 3.30. Thank you.